part of my job. Now, I can't make you do anything, but I can tell you, I can lead you. Do what? You're live. I'm live. That's I'm live. good. <laughs> that is not a good option. First Thessalonians chapter 5. And we've been on this series about living a lifestyle of prosperity. Tuesday nights, we've been on honor. Um, my plan is this coming Tuesday night is going to be the last one in that series talking about our character, um, which I know all of these are kind of intermingled. But I had one person text me uh, Wednesday morning after they had watched Tuesday night service, and they're joking, but they said, enough on this honor stuff. Can we get on something else? And uh, I said, it is, they said, it's very tough. But it's, it's been convicting to me. And so living this lifestyle of prosperity, I'm going to deal with some things today. I'm just going to warn you at the beginning. I'm going to get in your stuff. Because <laughs> that was my wife that went, Ugh, just in case anybody was wondering. But I'm telling you about things I know as, as the, it just in this church, in, in, in this body here, I understand as the pastor, as the shepherd of this group, I'm in the front, and, and I'm, I'm realizing more and more that what hits our body hits me first. And so I'm, I'm coming against it because of that. And that's what this whole series about prosperity is about because the devil would love, he's okay giving up what he's given up in your life. But when you get aggressive wanting to take more is when he gets really nervous. And I'm not done yet. I'm so thankful for what, he's, what God has given us. But let's go back through this. First Thessalonians chapter 5, we'll do some review and then we'll get into the area that, you know, <clears throat> you're going to love me afterwards anyway. Verse number 23, it says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. I, love, I'm not quitting until we're sanctified completely. That every part of you, that your perfect health, perfect <coughs> wealth, your family is the way it's supposed to be, you are doing what you want to do. I, I want to challenge you. I was going to do this earlier, but then I, the Holy Spirit kind of laid on my heart to make it a part of the message. I, because I want, I want to challenge you. I want to ask you, why do you do what you do? What makes you get up in the morning? What makes you get out of bed in the morning? Pastor, be honest with you, I ain't got nothing. That's why I'm staying in. No, no. <clears throat> what drives you? Because I, I was thinking about it today, you know, over the past couple weeks, for some reason, uh, we've had more of an opportunity to explain to people that, you know, we live in Versailles, we pastor in Babyville, we're assistant pastors in Lexington, and I, I, I was telling Elizabeth on the way down today, the Holy Spirit reminded me of a story that Jerry Seville tells, and uh, it's one of my favorite stories from his ministry. He was pastoring his church, and... Uh, you know, he travels and ministers, obviously at a much larger scale than I do. And when you travel and minister, it's very interesting because you go places, they're excited about you coming, they treat you like a king, and, and uh, then you come home and people are mad because somebody's sitting in their seat or parked in their parking space or you got raccoons in the sanctuary, had that. <clears throat> got home from a powerful trip to Brussels, one of the most powerful trips we've ever had. And I get home, and what i got to take care of is a raccoon has broken into the church in Lexington and destroyed the foyer. And so Jerry Seville, obviously at a much larger scale, is battling that same kind of stuff. He gets up behind a pulpit one Sunday morning, looks out at the people, and goes, I don't want to do this no more. And get out from behind the pulpit, left the church. Went home, put on his jeans, his boots, his T-shirt, jumped on his Harley, and took off. And he said he's driving down the road, and all of a sudden, this van slows down in front of him. The back doors swing open. Bikers come all the way up around him. It's a biker gang. He's freaking out. I mean, here he's just walked out from behind his pulpit, and now a biker gang, he's got them. He's repenting. Well, he ended up having a great afternoon with the guys and went back, apologized to his church, and said, I need to turn the church over to somebody else. Now, this is not Pastor Chip's way of telling you I'm turning the church over to someplace else, somebody else. But why do you do what you do? You know, most people will live, not, not most of us, but most people will live their entire lives never doing anything they want to do, just doing the things they have to do. And so what motivates you? What pushes you? 
Elizabeth and I love people so much, that's what motivates us. Well, you must love everything you do. I don't love everything I do, but I love what I do. And so I want to challenge you. I really want you to take some time over the next couple weeks and ask and find out, why are you doing what you do? What is motivating you to keep going every single day? Now, you may be in a period of your life where you're just kind of in a transition time, and, well, Pastor, that's where I want to be. But what's motivating you right now? What's pushing you? What's making you do better tomorrow than you did today? Because if there isn't something, you're going to wake up from a year from now and be no different. You're going to wake up 10 years from now and be no different, and you're going to get to the end of your life and have been, I wish I'd have. And I'm determined in my life, I'm not going to live a life of I wish I'd have done. And so God says, I want, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. God wants every, God wants you happy, healthy, wealthy. He wants you living your dream. Well, Pastor, God doesn't promise to live, I can live my dream. He says, you delight yourself in me, I'll give you the desires of your heart. And the Bible says, when the Spirit of God gets involved, I'm paraphrasing it, when the Spirit of God gets involved, He says, it'll be as if we were dreaming. I'm living my dream. I love my life. I love what I'm doing. And He says, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to 3 John. And I know we go over these every, every step of this series. But he says, 3 John, verse number 2, Beloved, I pray that in all respects, I like that, every part of your life, God wants you to prosper and be in health. That means not just physically healthy, He wants you emotionally healthy. He wants you socially healthy. What world does that mean? That we, we have friends, we get along with people, that we do well. He says, I pray that in all respects, you would prosper and be in health. And here's the key. This is what I want to deal with today. Even as your soul or your mind, your will, and your emotions, your thinker, your chooser, and your feeler prospers. And that's why the devil attacks you so strong in that head of yours, trying to keep you from living the life that God has paid the price for you to live. Amen. That's where your battleground's in your head. And beloved, until you learn to beat that thing, until you went, learn to win the battle of your thoughts, you are going to live a miserable life. Yeah. And you don't, if you can't control your thoughts, it's a miserable life. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll use me as an example. Is that okay? Yes. If anybody else would like to volunteer. <clears throat> we were flying home from Texas and, uh, you know, I have a magazine on the airplane and I'm reading the magazine and, and, um, the funny thing is, I've never had a problem with jet lag. Because I don't talk about having a problem with jet lag. If we fly overseas, if we fly to Europe or to Africa, when it's time to go to bed, I have, I have, and I don't like saying it this way, but I want you to understand, I have convinced myself it's time to go to bed. I don't think about what time it is at home. I don't think about how far ahead we are. I don't think about, well, what's everybody doing now? Okay, it's six hours behind, so it's, uh, it's time to go to bed. It's time to go to bed. I do not get jet lag. But for some reason, I'm looking at this magazine, and it says, here's what you do to take care of jet lag. <laughs> oh, no. And besides that, it's gummies. You understand? It's a, it's a, a, a supplement you take that's gummy bears. Well, what could be? The only thing that would be better is if it was a blizzard. <laughs> Eat the blizzard, and it'll take care of... So, you know, Elizabeth and I start talking about it. I said, let's try this. <laughs> so I go to the store and I buy some gummies. And I'm telling you what, we, we get up the next morning and, and I said, how'd you sleep? She goes, man, I had some weird dreams. <laughs> and she said, when you fell asleep, was it like light shooting at your eyes? I'm like, man, you're a weird woman. I don't know what happened to you, but I don't know what else you took. <laughs> She was, man. She's tripping. I'm going, I slept great. I don't like you. And I'll tell you what, all day Saturday, we are we don't fight. But it was like, I'm going to kill you. That's what's going on. I, I mean, it was about, it didn't matter what it was. Nobody, nobody did anything right. Throw them gummies away. 
<laughs> it's my story. <laughs> <laughs> and so I wake up this <laughs> Funny thing is, I took them again last night. They're gummies. I did it. She didn't. I did. We went, we went over to our son's house and we talked to him and his wife and, and uh, took them their first little UK baby stuff. But anyway, oh. and so we're telling them, we don't fight, but today I'm telling you what, we're each other's throats. And so finally, we're just sitting there watching TV and I'm thinking, I don't want to be around anybody. I said, I'm going to bed. That was it. One good night, honey. When I love you, didn't kiss you. I said, I'm going to bed. Yeah, she's, she's going, thank you, God. Get him out of here. And so I go back. What do I do? I pop two more of them. They're gummies. And, uh, and they can't be bad. They're gummy bears. I mean, seriously. Get a gummy bear ever hurt anybody. And so I wake up this morning, and I'm like, Ugh. for no reason. And the Holy Spirit says, you might want to check out the side effects of those. <laughs> That's the first thing God spoke to me. I mean, God didn't want me around me. <laughs> I'm kidding. He'll never leave, right. but he's as close as he's ever come to leaving me and forsaking me. And so I, I get up and I look, and it was like. So when Elizabeth wakes up, I said, "Huh, let me read you a list of stuff." And so I tell her, "She goes, sounds like you." <laughs> and I said, "That's the side effect of this stuff we've been taking. Picked them up off my dresser and threw them in the trash." And the Holy Spirit said, what are you doing? Seriously, what are you doing? Trying to get a supplement to what you've been do take doing by faith. How about this? Trying to find a shortcut so I don't have to use my faith. So I repented. I said, you know what? I'm going to stick to the Word. There are no bad side effects to it. And when I lay down, I go right to sleep. He gives his beloved sweet sleep. Yes. Isn't it funny though? We're always looking for a shortcut. Okay. Isn't it funny? I was looking for a shortcut. Yeah, quit that, Pastor. There aren't any. No. There aren't any. He says you're going to prosper and you're going to be in health to the same level that your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions, your thinker, your chooser, and your feel are prosper. And so look, it takes work not only to change the way you think, but maintain the way you think. You have to make a commitment to think the way the Word of God says to think. Go with me to John chapter 10. <clears throat> I tell you, yesterday was hell. It, 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 well, I'm, oh, I didn't want to be around me. You know, it's bad enough when other people don't want to be around you. I don't want to be around me. I didn't want to walk by a mirror because I didn't want to see me. <laughs> but done what I wanted to, I'd have taken all my pictures off the wall. I don't like that guy. He's not a whole lot of fun to be around. If you're wondering who the one the one is throwing stones, it's my wife. <laughs> but we were a pair. I'm telling you what. God bless us. John chapter 10 and verse number 10. Let's get back into this. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That's what God says. I want you to have life and I want you to have it abundantly. Verse number 10 in the Amplified, the thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may, I love this, they may have and enjoy life. Don't you want to enjoy life? Yes. I just, look, yesterday we, we were doing some work in our garage, and I was cleaning the garage, and, and it's amazing how junk accumulates, but I was just cleaning the garage, and so I back up our cars, and then I pull my motorcycles out, and I back up them, and I just step back, and I said, God, you are so good to me. You are amazing. That's, I, that's, we're get, I, I enjoy my life. That's where God desires every one of us to live, that you have life and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Now back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 24, because I know what the devil does. Well, Pastor, that's great for you, but I don't understand how you'd ever get it to me. I love what he says in verse 24. Faithful is he who calls you. He will also bring it to pass. 
So these aren't empty promises. These aren't promises for just a select few. These aren't promises that only work at a certain age. These aren't promises that only work if you start it. You've done it for so many years. If God calls you to do it, He will bring it to pass. Now go with me to um, <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 23. God wants you to rule and to reign in every area of your life. Spiritually, financially, physically, family, jobs, in everything. I want you to get this phrase on the inside of you. Whatever you tolerate is going to become your standard. And the longer you put up, listen to me, beloved, the longer you put up with anything less than what God has promised, the more difficult it's going to be to change it in your life. You know, if, if I would um, just out of the side of the building and take a hose and just start running water down through the parking lot, it's not going to make that big of a difference. But if I leave it there, and it continues to run and continues to run and continues to run. The longer it runs, the deep, the deeper that rut's going to become and the tougher it's going to be to fix. And it's the same thing in your thought life. You may think, well, this it really doesn't matter if I let this thought in. You think on it long enough, eventually it's going to become embedded in your subconscious and it's going to become a habit in your life. Every one of us has done it. Um, I mean, simple things that we do, the first time we do it, it's no big deal, but you do it over and over and over, and now it just becomes normal. Proverbs chapter 23. I want you to understand, you have to, re you have to retrain your mind to think prosperous. And not only do you have to retrain your mind to think prom uh, uh, prosperous, you can't allow a poverty mentality to creep back in. Because poverty mentality is always working to make its way back into your thought life. Because if it can make it its way back into your thought life, it can make its way back into your life. And so that's what I want to deal with this morning is not allowing a poverty mentality. And so Proverbs chapter 23, verse number 7, for as he thinks within himself, so he is. Now, I just want the first part of verse number 7. And we're more familiar with the King James version of that when he says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now, I want you to notice something, beloved. And I'm going to ask you a very important question. The book of Proverbs, is it Old Testament or New Testament? Since it's Old Testament, is it before the resurrection or after the resurrection? I know, this is deep, isn't it? So if it's before the resurrection, then men were spiritually dead. So that word heart can't be talking about your spirit man. That word heart in the Hebrew is referring to your mind. Because as a man thinks, so is he. And remember, we all know examples of it. The examples that I always give, you know people that, that are not physically attractive but feel like they are. We know you, you know people that are in their 50s or in their 60s and think. We have, we have friends and they have a teenage son at the time of this story. Their, their son was a teenager and uh, the father was in his 40s and, uh, you know, had a gut on him. And, and uh, they, they went on a family vacation to the beach. Now, the son, it was a good looking young man, built, played football. I mean, just a, a muscular kid. And these two teenage girls walked by like, yeah. And the dad is like, no. I still got it. And they made it very clear. We're looking at your son. And all of a sudden, that furniture problem came back. You understand the furniture problem? His chest done falling in his drawers. I mean, for a minute there, he thought, I'm all that. <laughs> And so we all know, I mean, people that are, are not very attractive that think they are, and we also know people that are attractive that don't think they are. Yeah. And it doesn't even matter what you tell them, it's what they think within them, themselves is what really matters. It's amazing, love, when you think good about yourself, how well you'll take care of yourself. 
when you don't think very highly of yourself, you'll, you, you'll see. Anyway, let's keep going. That's blessing you, so we're going to find something you like. Go back over there to 3 John. Because he said, Beloved, I wish above all things, or I pray that in all respects, verse number 2, that you would prosper and be in health, even as that, that Greek word katop. Pastor, my goodness, how many times are you going to preach on this? Until we get it. And then when we get it, I'm going to keep preaching on it because we have not attained to the level. I was thinking yesterday, um, actually it was Friday when we were flying home. We flew out of the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. And I watched a couple private jets come in. Um, very nice jets. You know, you're talking 10, 12, 15 million dollar jets that people are flying. And I remember back, I remember hearing the testimony of when Brother Copeland, I don't know how many years ago it was now, bought his ministry headquarters. And everybody thought he was crazy because he was buying an abandoned Air Force base just outside of Fort Worth. And they thought, this is crazy. What's this, what's this little preacher that ain't got nothing doing buying this old Air Force base? And now, looking back, how much sense that made. I don't know how many airplanes he owns. He'll have his minister's conference, and the last one we went to, I think was about four or five years ago, they announced, I believe there were 27 private jets that came in for the meeting mm -hmm. that were all able to land at Brother Copeland's airstrip. Well, then after he bought this prop, now he thought he was crazy, but all he could see was, number one, God told me to do it, and number two, God has made me prosperous. Well, then after he'd been on it for a while, they discovered natural gas under his land. And so he sat on it for years, except he bought three generators. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is what he named them that run off natural gas, and he no longer pays anybody for electricity. Amen. He also has his own water treatment plant because it was an abandoned Air Force base. I mean, it's amazing. He was, he was thinking far out in the future. Yeah, I don't need this right now, but the day is coming that it's going to make perfect sense. Now, understand, I, I, I don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but now he looks like a genius. Well, yeah, he had all this, yeah, because he was thinking about it. He was, yes, this is where we're going. Most people live so caught up in the daily grind, we can't see past the end of our nose, and we're not thinking anything in the future. We're just, how do I get to tomorrow? How do I get to Monday? Pe most of the people in the world live from Monday to Friday. Yeah. And dread Sunday night. Mine just starts all over because that's all they ever see. It's all they meditate on. It's all they think about. John says, Third John 1, or verse number 2 says, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. Now, I want to read this out of the Wiest translation. That's W-U-E-S-T. He's a Greek scholar. And this is what it says, verse number 2. Beloved, in all things I am praying. Now, listen that you will be prospering and that you will be continually having good health just as your soul is prospering. Now, I want you to notice the tense that Wiest puts it in. Everything is currently running. It's not like you make the decision to prosper and then it's done. I, I, want, you, I want you to think about that as I read it again. Beloved, in all things I'm praying that you will be prospering and you will be continually having good health just as your soul is prospering. That You don't understand what I'm saying? That yes. puts it in the continual process yes. that I have to live. It's not a one-time decision. I am prospering right now at the level that my mind, my will, my emotions, my thinker, my chooser, my feeler are prospering. If I can understand that, that means I'm not letting any contrary thoughts off. You can't take a break from faith. Yeah. Love it. If we truly understood that, if we truly understood how much damage we do when we allow unfaith thoughts in. Now understand the thoughts don't do damage, 
But you meditate on the thoughts long enough, they're going to become a part of you. And if they become a part of you, eventually they're going to come out of your mouth. And if they come out of your mouth, you have now given life to them. I love the way he says it. I'm going to read it one more time. Beloved, in all things I'm praying that you will be prospering, that you will be continually having good health. <coughs> Can I say it this way? Just as, you are con just as your soul is continually prospering. Now go to Proverbs chapter 4. <coughs> there is constant pressure. That's what Paul wrote when he wrote to the church at Rome when he said, um, don't be conformed to this world. I believe it's the Phillips translation that says, don't let the world around you press you into its mold. There's constant pressure to think like the world thinks. Yes. Who do you think you are? It's it was it was funny on this trip. I don't know why. Um, it was just real different this time. I, I wore a Harley Davidson T-shirt on the flight down. We went real, I went real casual. I don't even fly this way. I have shorts and T-shirt on. And. Uh, I was amazed at how many people stopped me and asked me. They said, I like your t-shirt. Do you have one? <laughs> Everything in me, I wanted to say, I ride an electric scooter and I drive a <laughs> priest. Why? <laughs> but it was, I mean, it, it was funny, their mentality. Like, it's like, do you really have one or are you a poser? <laughs> you could tell that's what they were all asking. <laughs> And I said, that one guy, when we stopped to pick up our rental car, the guy goes, oh, I like your T-shirt. Do you have a Harley? I said, or do you have a motorcycle? I said, actually, I have three. And he stopped me and went, I need to hang out with you. Because the world can't comprehend that. It's a total different way of thinking. I talked about the guy at the, the auto parts store near our house. And he all I did was I, I, I drove two different vehicles to go pick up parts. He goes, how many toys you got in your garage? Their mentality is lack. And God's mentality is more than enough. Right. Exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or even imagine. I'm not going to apologize for the blessing of God. And so here he says in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, Watch over your heart. And remember, Proverbs is which testament? Watch over your heart with all diligence. Now, let me read this. It says, For from it flows the springs of life. Now, I want to read it out of the King James because it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. New American says springs of life, which is a real interesting way that it's translated because the word there for issues is, the Hebrew word is T-O-T-S-A-A-H, totza. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but that's how it's spelled, totza. Now it says, keep your heart, your mind, your will, and your emotions, your thinker, your chooser, and your feeler. Keep it with all diligence. Now, do you understand what that means, with all diligence? That means it's going to take some work on your part. I'm, I'm telling you, beloved, if you watch the news, you would build a bunker under your house and never leave. But I don't know how to think that way. You know, we got people telling us, don't travel anymore, don't. No, then the devil wins. You know, he, 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 his whole plan is to put fear into people. Listen, you can say what you want to about what's going on with terrorism and all that kind of stuff. The whole purpose behind it is to put fear into people to get them to stop spreading the gospel. You're afraid to leave home. You're afraid of offending somebody. We live in a society that is so afraid of offending somebody. I don't care if I offend you. If the word offends you, that's between you and the word, not me. But he's, that word, their issues, is the Hebrew word totza. It is a real estate term describing the outlying borders of your property. Now, I want you to get this. It's like if you own 10 acres, then the, the issue or the totza, and again, I don't, I don't think I'm saying it right, but the totza would be the outlying border of that 10 acres. That's what belongs to you. And he's saying, you got to keep your mind with all diligence because you are setting the borders for your life. You're never going to go any further than you think you are. 
You're never going to achieve more than you think that you'll achieve. Well, Pastor, I, you know, nobody in my family has ever minded anything. And, you know, we've all been, this is what we've always done. This is what we're always going to do. You have set the border for your life. You're setting the borders of your life, the borders of your prosperity. Now listen to me by what you allow yourself to think about. Now I'm going to say this. This is kind of a blanket statement, but most people have no idea how to control their thoughts. And most people don't know the difference between the voice of God and just a thought that pops in their head. Pastor, how do you know which is which? Number one, the voice of God doesn't come in your head. It comes down in your spirit. Yes. Number two, the voice of God will never be contrary to what His Word says. Number three, you will know whether you're hearing the voice of God by your track record. If nothing you ever so-called hear has been accurate, then I question what you're hearing. Now listen, if I start getting up telling you stuff, here's what God told me to do, and a week later I've changed my mind. Here I say, this is the word that God's given us, and a week later I say, yea, yea, the Lord hath made a mistake. That's one of my favorite stories about prophecy. I got up during a service. Now this actually happened. This is not a story. This actually happened. A guy gets up and prophesies, and he says, As Joshua led the children of Israel through the wilderness, and as Joshua led the children, he started out and goes, As Joshua led the children of Israel out of Egypt, as Joshua led the children of Israel through the wilderness, as Joshua led the children of Israel through the Red Sea, so I am leading you, blah, blah, blah. And he sat down. About a minute later, he step, step, sat back, or sat, sat back up, stood back up and said, Yay, yay, the Lord hath made a mistake. It was Moses that led the children. <laughs> and we laugh at that. But how many things have we done that we said, God said? And the funny thing, I'm telling you, beloved, that's why divine order is so vital. Because too many times what we want to do is what we say God told us. Because once you put the label on it, God said, there's no argument left. You understand what I'm saying? Because as soon as you come to me and say, Pastor, God told me to do this and I'm going to do it. What argument do I have left? The only argument I have is you're a fool. Which doesn't go over very well. But what, but so what, what do you say? Be careful when you say it's God. Because a lot of times what we want to hear is just what we want to do. Yeah. And we just put God's stamp of approval on it. He ain't stamped nothing. You're setting the borders of your life, the borders of your prosperity by what you allow yourself to think about. Now, what I want to deal with in the rest of this message is we cannot afford to let a, a poverty mentality in our lives in any way. Amen. Amen. And it is constantly <laughs> trying to come back at you. Now, let me, let me talk to you about some things. I've just got four or five things that will let you know if you're allowing a, a, a poverty mentality to come back. Number one, you're afraid of being without. I, I, well, Pastor, you understand my past. And, and, and it had nothing to do with your past. You either believe in the provision of God or you don't. And so if, you, if there's a fear, I'm not talking about thoughts that pop in your head that the devil tries to tell you you're going to starve, you're going to do without. I'm talking, you understand what I mean? People have a real fear of doing without. And people that have a fear of doing without will hoard. Won't throw anything away. It doesn't matter what it is. My favorite, I don't remember the number now. I taught on this years ago and somebody told me they went and cleaned out a woman's house that had passed away and she had something like 132 butter dishes. <laughs> You know, the Tupperware things you buy at the store. Now, listen, I don't know what emergency's coming. <laughs> that we're going to need to sandbag with butter dishes, but she was ready. That's fun. The, the fear of doing without will drive you to do stuff. How many have ever pulled off a piece of, piece of aluminum foil and it was too small, 
to use for what you wanted to use it for, and you fold it up and put it back in the drawer. <laughs> <laughs> God, we don't need dates and times. <clears throat> now, how many times do we eventually just go back and throw it away? <laughs> no, you don't. I throw it away. <laughs> we just we bought the pre-cut aluminum foil. Comes out of a box like tissues. It's awesome. Do you know how much more that costs? <laughs> okay, number two. We're not done with that, afraid of doing with that. We're going to come back to that in a second because I'll, I'll hit on something. <laughs> when you walk, listen, we're talking we're talk about look. <laughs> talking about fighting a poverty mentality. When you walk in a store, the first place you go is the markdown rack. <laughs> and the funny thing is, well, it don't fit me, but I got a great deal on it. Oh, no. It'll come back in style. <laughs> them frilly shirt fronts, they ain't never coming back. I refuse them to let, to let them come back. But I got a great deal on it. The thought, well listen, the thought of buying something new makes you break out in a cold sweat. You'd rather get it at a garage sale, a yard sale, or a secondhand store. <clears throat> I don't have a problem getting a deal on it. I really don't. One of our favorite, and, and, and I don't. <laughs> We enjoy going to a store like Marshall's. Now, if you've ever been in a Marshall's, Marshall's, you can't go in looking for anything because there's no set stuff that they have. We like going through there because, number one, it's fun. It's kind of like a, a treasure hunt. You know, what might be here? And so I don't remember where we were, but uh, people kept commenting on Elizabeth's blouses. Oh, did you get that at Marshall's? No, I got this at Miller's. Did you get that at Marshall's? No, I got this at Macy's. Don't you shop at Marshall's anymore? <laughs> and I love Elizabeth's answer. I love it. She goes, I do, but I don't have to anymore. I like that. We can still go in there. I don't mind getting a deal. Don't misunderstand me. But that's not my first thought. My first thought is if we want it, let's go get it. It frustrates my kids to no end. Christian told me at Father's Day, she said, Dad, do you understand? I love prosperity, but it's frustrating because if you want it, you just go buy it. Then leave us anything to go get you. You don't even think about buying anything new. It makes you freak out in a sweat. Number four, you don't throw anything away. I knew one person that underneath his house, he had a crawl space underneath his house, he had nine lawnmowers that did not work. Nine lawnmowers that don't work. I said, what are you going to do with them? I don't know. Why do you have them? They're still good. No, they don't work. Your definition of still good and my definition of still good are two very, very different things. The funny thing is, that mentality, unless you really work to get out of it, I'll never forget it. That same person came to me and they said, Pastor, I brought you something. I said, oh, really? What'd you bring me? I got you. And, and, and we were playing golf. Pastor Callahan and I were playing golf twice a week back then. And uh, a lot of the days we would walk nine holes. And he said, I got you a, a cart bag or bag cart. It was just a little hand cart. You strap your golf bag to it and you pull it with a handle. I said, well, God, that's awesome. Thank you. And he goes, well, I got it out of somebody's trash, and this is broken right here, but I've already contacted the company, and they'll send you the part. <laughs> now, I didn't say anything because I was a lot nicer back then, but I thought, you went in somebody else's trash, picked up something they were throwing away, and you, you didn't even fix it yourself. 
the poverty mentality. Fifth thing. Now, listen, beloved. Let me let me put this in while you're here. I understand that where up whatever level you are, you have to do what you need to do. I remember one family that that were good friends of us years ago. Good friends of ours years ago. Their kids had never tasted real maple syrup for their you know pancake syrup because caro syrup was much cheaper. And so they made up this home, it was nasty stuff, but the, but it was cheaper to do. And I understand being at that place. I understand. But beloved, if you never come out of it, that poverty mentality is controlling you. If you have to step on your tube of toothpaste to get the next thing out, it might be time for a new tube. Yeah. Where you going, honey? Gotta go get the hammer. Right? I need some more toothpaste. Throw the thing away. What it, seriously, what's a tube of toothpaste cost? A dollar. Thank you very much. At the... 50 cents? <laughs> but I'm telling you what, we're taking a hammer, we're taking that toothbrush, and we're, and we're squeezing it. And it used to be striped toothpaste, and now it's just all one color. <laughs> Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Poverty mentality. I, and again, I understand you have to work at whatever level you are. Our, our daughter, Elisa, is, I don't know if she's still doing it now when they lived in Texas. She was the coupon queen. I'm telling you what, she knew when it was double coupon day and where it was. and I mean, she had them on her phone and all that kind of stuff. People did not want to get behind her in line. <laughs> I don't have any problem using coupons. My goodness, they send them to us. They, I have them on my phone. They, we went in the other day, and Elizabeth goes, watch. And she pulls them out, and there's like $26 in coupons. I said, you go, girl. I'm fine. I got no problem with that. But my daughter, Lisa, she said, Daddy, is it wrong to use coupons? I said, no, honey, but don't stay here. You don't want to live your life only going and buying the things that are on sale that's not the God kind of life. The God kind of life is all sufficiency and abound to every good work. I refuse to let poverty mentality back in. Second Corinthians chapter 9. I want to give you some scriptures because every one of us has that pressure of doing without. You may say, Pastor, I'm talking about, you know, you always talk about how blessed you are and how much you have, and I know you don't deal with it. Oh, okay. Um, you book a flight anywhere out of the country. And there's always constant pressure. And I'm telling you what, once you get your wife to fly business class, it's tough to fly back with the commoners. I don't like it either. A lot of, when we, when we go to Brazil at the end of the month, when I get, we arrive on Tuesday morning and I start preaching Tuesday night, he said, I've scheduled in one day off for you. Now that means multiple services Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever day off, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then we fly home Monday. And I've learned how important it is to take care of us if we're going to keep doing what we're doing. And so don't get this idea, Pastor Jim has no idea what it's like. Pastor Jim is dealing with the exact same things you deal, at, deal with at another level. <clears throat> and that's, I, I know what the devil does. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 8, it says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. So anytime that poverty mentality tries to come in, I'll open my mouth and say, I have all sufficiency and I abound every good work. It's impossible for me to be in lack because God has made all grace abound to me and I have all sufficiency and I abound to every good work. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 19. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That spirit of poverty tries to come in, that poverty mentality, God supplies all my need according to his riches and glory. Not according to my need, but according to his riches and glory. Amen. Go to Psalm 34, verse number 10. We're going to go through these kind of quick. If you want to write down the references, I'm telling you, beloved, <clears throat> I've done some work for you. That's what this is all about. I've done some work for you. I'm trying to 
if that poverty mentality tries to come back, I'm not talking about being foolish. I'm not talking about you can't save anything. That's not what I'm talking about. But the mentality behind your saving is what's important. Psalm 34 and verse number 10. This is another one of my favorite. The young lions do laugh at lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. God, I seek you. I'm sorry that the lions do lack and suffer hunger, but I'm seeking you and I don't lack any good thing. Now, I want you, I want you to see the level of abundance. 2 Chronicles chapter 9. Can you take just a little bit more? 2 Chronicles chapter 9. Again, this is Old Testament. This is Old Covenant. And I want you to remember through this, we have a better covenant established on better promises. 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse number 13. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. And that's not very impressive. Because we don't know what how much talent is. But let's look at some things. Now this is a, this is according to Bible dictionaries. A talent of silver contained three thousand shekels and was equal to ninety four point three seven pounds. That's a that's a talent of silver. A talent of gold was double the weight of a talent of silver. So a talent of silver weighs just over 94 pounds, which means a talent of gold is double that, 188 pounds. Let's say 189 pounds. So the amount of gold that came to Solomon, Old Testament, was 666 times 189 pounds. Right? Right? Remember, a talent of silver is 94 pounds. A talent of gold is double what the talent of silver is. What's well, 98 times 2? We trust you, Pastor. Just tell us. Okay. <clears throat> so can I do a little math for you? As of June 28th, at closing, the price of gold is $1,318.30. An ounce. An ounce. Thank you. An ounce. There are 16 ounces in a pound. One talent of gold is 189 pounds. So, 666 talents of gold equals 126,140 pounds of gold. Okay? 126,140 pounds of gold equals 2,018,240 ounces. Okay? I'm just waiting for those of you doing the math in your head to check my numbers. Which equals 2,660,645,792 dollars worth of gold that came to Solomon every year. And that's how much the United States spends in... <laughs> 30 seconds. That's how much our national debt increases in 42 seconds. But now I want you to look at what verse 14 says. Besides that which the traders and merchants brought and all the kings of Arabia and the governors of the country brought gold and silver to Solomon. See, beloved, I want you to get this. This is, this is something you've got to change in the way you think. Can I say it this way? Solomon had a certain amount of income that came from his job. And on top of that, he had 2.7 billion that just came to him. See, if we can change the way we think. Yeah, God uses your job. God uses your profession, whatever it is, to get money to you. But that's not God's main source. God is God's main source. Because He's not limited. 
I don't care how good you are at what you do, there's a limit to how much you can make. That's right. <laughs> but in God's system, I love that verse 14 is in there. God said, look, no, no, I, I'm telling you, I blessed him $2.7 billion a year in gold besides what he was making from his businesses. Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 6, it says, Now he, talking about Jesus, had obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted on better promises. We have better than what Solomon had. It drives me. I'm not going to get to heaven and have Solomon come to me and say, What happened? Thought you had a better covenant. Let me, let me give you some other scriptures. Just, just a couple more scriptures that I stand on. To keep, I, I refuse to let a poverty mountain mentality come in. I was get, and let me tell you what I'm talking about. I was getting ready to book our tickets to Brazil. We leave in three weeks. I was getting ready to book our tickets in Brazil. And, and the thoughts start coming. You know, it would be a lot cheaper if you... It would be a lot cheaper if you... I refuse to go cheap. I'm not talking about being foolish financially. But I'm not settling. This weekend, that, that poverty mentality, trying to pressure coming, I'm telling you everything in my house got a price tag on it. Well, if I sell that, if I sell that, if I sell that, if I sell that. It's like the Holy Spirit said, what are you going to sell next week? Because eventually you're going to run out of stuff to sell. I do have some supplements for sale. Gummy bear supplements if anybody's wanting to feel angry and First Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 7 who at any time serves as a soldier as an own expense who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it or who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock well that's a scripture that I stand on look I don't do what I do I do it because God called me to do it and God said I'll pay for it don't worry about it Luke chapter 6 verse number 38 says give and it will be given to you we know the rest of the verse. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 6. The one who's taught in the Word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Don't be deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever you sow, that you're going to reap. God, I got seed in the ground. Psalm 112. <clears throat> I love this one. Psalm 112. Let's start at verse number 1. Praise the Lord, how blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandment. I like that. Are you greatly delighting in his commandments? Because there's a benefit. I'm not talking about keeping the Ten Commandments. Do you greatly delight in obeying what God tells you to do? <clears throat> Verse 2, his descendants will be mighty on the earth. I like that. My kids, my grandkids, my great-grandkids. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Verse 3, wealth and riches are in his house. I like that. Wealth and riches. Well, being wealthy is not just money. Being riches. He says both. Wealth and riches are in my house. And my righteousness endures forever. And one more verse. Proverbs chapter 10. That's how you keep a poverty mentality out. You got to keep word coming out of your mouth. It is the blessing, Proverbs 10, 22, it is the blessing of the Lord that makes me rich. And he adds no sorrow with it. I'm telling you, beloved, do not let that lack, that poverty mentality come back in. We're not looking for the cheapest way to do everything. We're not looking for how we can get by without. Because whatever you tolerate is going to become the standard in your life and in the lives of the people around you that are looking to see what you do. Hallelujah. Let's stand.